This is Chapter 29, The Child with Musculoskeletal or Articulation Dysfunction, Part 2, and we're moving on to fractures. Uh, fractures are common in, in childhood, um, and how we treat them with kids is different, though, than older people. We don't see as many uh, fractures in infants. I mean, they just aren't mobile and able to fall the way older kids are. Um, the exception to that is motor vehicle accidents. The most commonly broken bone in childhood is the clavicle, um, and that's particularly on, on smaller kids under age 10. And then in school age kids, we see injuries from bicycles and from sports. So this is not from our current textbook, but um, or it just lists the words, and I thought it was nice to have pictures. So a closed fracture means we have a fracture inside the tissue. Nothing is sticking out. An open fracture, this is also sometimes uh, called compound. You have a bone sticking out. So now we not only have the issue of the fracture, we also have issue of infection. Extra capsular outside of a joint, so it looks like this is down here, or intracapsular inside of a joint, and that looks like it's somewhere here in the hip. Um, comminuted means there are little fragments, bone fragments, that they've got to deal with. Uh, longitudinal, so the, the crack, the fracture goes down, where transverse it just goes across. Oblique, it's at an angle spiral it's twisting like the stripe on a candy cane this occasionally happens like if a child's spinning and their foot gets caught in something and it twists um, but this should always be suspicious for abuse uh, most of the time a spiral fracture is a parent grabbing and twisting different directions with the two hands and snapping a bone. Um, so it's not a hundred percent that it's a situation of abuse, but it should always, there should always be a few extra questions about how it happened and the story needs to match that spiral kind of fracture. So it had to happen with a twisting motion. Um, and if it matches then it, then that's fine. But if it doesn't, you don't get a spiral fracture just from fall. You fall out of a tree unless something is caught and your body was spinning. It's not going to cause that spiral fracture. Um, and then pathologic. So we have a tumor or something that weakens the bone and causes the fracture to happen at that weak spot. Um, so the types of fractures that kids usually get are these. A plastic uh, deformation, so a deformed, just curved, right? If you take um, a nice young green branch off a tree and bend it, it may not come back straight, but because it's more bendable, it doesn't snap. Or if you take an old dry branch and try and bend it, it snaps right away. Same thing with a kid's bone. It can bend but rather than break because it's just not quite as um, stiff, but it may not come back to straight. So that's that plastic deformation. Uh, if it does come back to, to straight, but it didn't break, you can get this buckle. This would be, it bent this way. This is the area that kind of got damaged where the bend was, um, but it didn't fully break, so you get a buckle. A green stick fracture is partial. Uh, just like if you've ever tried to break a tree branch and you break it most of the way and you can't quite get it to break all the way because it's a green young tree branch as opposed to something dry. Same idea. Um, then complete, meaning it went all the way through. A complete can have the periosteum totally torn or a hinge of periosteum holding the two together and this is not necessarily good or bad it can sometimes make it easier sometimes make it harder when they're trying to set this uh, let me just say that fracture means break I've heard some people not in the medical community will say oh well it wasn't broken it was only a fracture 
I think in a lot of people's mind, fracture means partial as opposed to break. Um, fracture is just the medical term for break. It doesn't imply how severe it is or isn't. Um, so anyway, with kids, the other thing we worry about is their growth plate, that epiphyseal cartilaginous growth plate. And so that is the, the, uh, softest part of the bone and that is where breaks happen the most on kids and that can affect growth so this one the break is right across the growth plate um, this one it's across the growth plate and then going up into the the bone into the long part of the bone here it's across the growth plate going out into the the distal end here here it, it crosses the growth plate but isn't really along it and this is just a, a kind of crushed and then um, abnormal development of growth plate or uh, kind of leaves it abnormal from a crush so those are just the different ways that um, a fracture can go through the growth plate but whenever we have the growth plate involved we're worried about future growth growth of that extremity that it can impact uh, and cause less growth to that extremity. So bone healing uh, takes place in, in different stages. First, you break a bone, it, it triggers all those osteoblasts and you start making a procallus. So this is fairly soft, usually within 24 to 48 hours. The interesting thing about that is if there's no displacement of the bone, this procallus has to have started developing for it to show up on an x-ray. So occasionally if you go in too early for an x-ray, they won't see anything. And they'll say, um, if it's still hurting like this, still feeling like this, come back in a couple of days because then that procallus is formed and that, that shows up on a x-ray. If it's displaced at all, then they can see it. It's when it, it breaks but stays um, correctly aligned, they can't necessarily see it um, too early. So after the procallus, a callus forms, or it could be called the bony callus. And that goes on for about three to four weeks. After that, now the ossification starts, so you're ossifying, you're um, turning this hard into regular bone, and that's going to go around three to ten weeks. It's making mature bone, but you've got all this extra callus formation that you started with. Basically, you kind of make this cap around the two ends to hold them together. Then you make the normal bone between them. Then you've got to go back and remodel or reabsorb all that extra callus formation you did to hold it together. So a bone is nice and stable once you get fairly far into this ossification, but it's not fully done until you complete all this remodeling. And this is just sort of showing out of 100% of the time for uh, a bone healing. It starts out with this inflammatory process, which is maybe 10% of the time, and then restoring the bone um, is less than 50%. And then the cleaning up all the extra bony callus stuff continues on. And that is the biggest part of bone healing. So it's nice and stable once we get, you know, well into this, but it's not done. So, clinical manifestations of a fracture. Well, you get swelling, pain or tenderness. If it's displaced, it can look deformed. Sometimes it's really obvious. You can't use it. Uh, that swelling impedes function or the just the lack of bone integrity impedes function. You can also get bruising, um, muscular rigidity, crepitus. Crepitus is that sound of bone crunching if you move bone against bone uh, crepitus you may have heard that before it's also um, sub q emphysema so if you have air uh, 
in the sub q tissue and you touch it, it kind of is a crunchy feeling. So crepitus is a feeling of crunchiness or a sound of crunchiness. So we're going to treat most of these with a cast. Uh, we can do casts in either plaster or a synthetic material. Um, one of the problems with plaster is they take so long to dry, 10 to 72 hours. They're also heavy, so you want to be turning them every couple of hours, because if you just leave it one way, um, that cast won't stay in a nice shape. It'll kind of sink down. Um, you want a fan in the room to help it dry, but you want to make sure it dries from the inside out, so you don't want to use anything like a blow dryer on it. That would dry the outside and leave the inside wet. It can also um, wick in that heat through that moisture that's still on the inside and cause burns. So um, no hot blow dryers, but a cool fan in the room. We don't do a lot of plaster casts anymore. We do far more synthetic ones because they dry quickly. And by quickly, I mean minutes, um, as opposed to hours to a few days. They're also much lighter. The synthetic material itself is waterproof, uh, but there's usually a cotton batting that we put on the skin first before we put it on, and that is not waterproof. But if somebody drips a little bit of water on it, you can just wipe it off, where plaster cast is not at all waterproof. Um, one of the drawbacks is they don't mold quite as closely and quite as well around uh, the site. And if you're really trying to immobilize it, that closer, uh, tighter fit of a plaster cast might be better. So one of our big issues with fractures is compartment syndrome. And this can be caused either by the cast or skin. So you get so, in compartment syndrome, you get so much swelling and it can't go out. There's no more stretch available either to the skin or because of the cast being there. So you start getting pressure pushing in until it pushes on the blood vessels and the nerves and um, it is a medical emergency because you can push so hard that you compress the arteries and you're no longer sending blood to that extremity. So the symptoms we're looking for on any fracture, and really what we're looking for is compartment syndrome. Uh, our book uses the five P's, which is pain, pulse, or in compartment syndrome, it's going to be pulseless, pallor, so pale, Paresthesia, uh, so this is compression on that nerve. You're going to get weird tingling um, or weird or no sensations and paralysis, inability to move it. If we do, if the physician does think compartment syndrome has happened, if we have any question about these five P's, we're going to notify the physician. They're going to come and look. If they think compartment syndrome has happened, they're going to do a fasciotomy which means to cut the fascia. So we've got so much pressure somewhere, and and there's several different places where um, there's fascia around here. So that's why it's compartments. One of these compartments is pushing so hard, it's compressing our nerves, our arteries, our veins, so that they aren't functioning. They're going to open the skin open the skin and open um, the fascia around that compartment to relieve the pressure. So that means we have a big open wound now. We have, I mean, this can happen after a fracture, uh, but now we also have an open wound and we're leaving it open. The idea is we're making it so there's more stretch available um, so it doesn't squeeze. So we've got to worry about infection. Uh, we're going to leave it open long enough that it can't be sutured. It's going to kind of dry and not be able to reseal. It's going to make a pretty ugly scar, but if you don't treat compartment syndrome, you can lose the extremity. So um, it's not, not as bad as that.